Happy Wednesday after Easter. I trust that your Easter holiday was a blessed one and a joyous one in spite of the circumstances we are under. We are continuing our Thursday night through the Bible study as we continue with Paul's epistle to the Philippians. I want to read the section we're looking at tonight with you, and uh, I trust that it will be an encouragement to you because it's one of Paul's most special passages. It's his testimony about his passion, about his desire to know Christ. And so the passage we have before us is Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I invite you to reflectively follow along as I read from Paul's epistle. He writes, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me. For you, it is a safeguard. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has a reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Well, you can clearly see that Paul's theme here continues to be joy. He offers himself as a model to emulate because he's going to share with us his greatest passion. And he wants to repeat for us the gospel one more time. In fact, he's going to be emphatic about that. In the first verse, he says, I'm writing the same things to you, what I've written before, but that's all right. It's good for you to hear these things again, because the church is meant to stand by and live for the gospel. And that means you can never hear it enough. Besides, it helps to keep us from compromising the gospel, which is always threatened. And he uses some very strong language here in verse 2. Beware of the dogs, the evil workers, those who mutilate the flesh. Now that's some strong language, some very derogatory terms that Paul uses here. Dogs, evil workers, mutilators of the flesh. For us, it doesn't seem as derogatory, at least that first phrase, because we keep dogs as pets. But in the ancient world, dogs were scavengers who fed on garbage heaps, and they were often associated with uncleanness and filth. And so it's no surprise this is a pejorative Jewish term often used for Gentiles. Now, Paul uses these derogatory terms because he's concerned about a distortion of the gospel, a distortion that we often call the Judaizing distortion that comes from Judaizers. This is the teaching that Gentiles must become essentially ethnic Jews to actually be the people of God. They do that by receiving the ethnic boundary marks of observing Sabbath, of observing the food laws, of participating in circumcision. So this could be some Jewish Christians who, like in Acts 15, say, unless you're circumcised according to the law of Moses, you can't be saved. It could also be some Gentile converts, people who weren't Jewish by birth, and they themselves had submitted themselves to these ethnic boundary markers. And since they'd done it, they resented those who didn't because that would prove their decision to be circumcised and to participate in the food laws was rather pointless and unnecessary. Paul resists this movement because for him, this fundamentally changes the gospel. It makes it so that salvation is no longer by grace through Christ, but 
salvation is by works of the law. And that strong resistance is demonstrated in his harsh language, but do not be offended by that. This is typical prophetic language to shake hearers from their complacency. John the Baptist uses it when he says, you brood of vipers. Our Lord Jesus uses it when he says, woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. And so Paul uses this heated language because he's afraid of this distortion, and he's going to use this distortion against those who are taking the gospel and adding the works of the law to it. He's going to give them a taste of their own medicine by saying of the Gentile believers, we are the true circumcision, which in the Hebrew Bible even, circumcision is always presented as a matter of the heart. He wants to suggest that the Gentiles apart from the works of the law, are the true people of God who worship in the Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And that's when he begins his argument. He says, you know, if anyone wants to have confidence in the flesh, I am the one that can trump them in every way. Notice how he puts it in our reading. He says, verse 4, I have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. And then he gives seven qualities that he possesses. Four are by birth and three are by achievement. First off, he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm an eighth dayer. I'm identified by birth with the covenant people of God. I'm not a Gentile convert who was circumcised later, but I was actually circumcised when you're supposed to be as an infant on the eighth day. Then he says, I'm a member of the people of Israel, and I can even trace my lineage through the tribe of Benjamin. This is something that many Israelites of Paul's day could not do other than priest. They, they couldn't trace their lineage, but Paul had a particularly distinguished family who could actually trace their lineage all the way back to the tribe of Benjamin. And then he says, I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrews. I have impeccable qualifications from birth to claim all the privileges of membership in Israel. So these four qualities he has inherited from birth, and then he gives three qualities that he's actually achieved as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. And this is where Paul begins to list his achievements. He says, you know what? I'm part of that popular party of the separated ones, the holy ones, the Pharisees. This party was popular among the people because they desired to live every detail of all of life according to God's law. They emphasized the purity of laws, and they sought to live as priests among the people, maintaining the priestly standards of purity in daily life. Then Paul says, I am also zealous which is to say he was at one time a militant nationalist. He was at one time committed to the nationalist cause, which was demonstrated by his willingness to persecute and even murder some of the Christians earlier in his life. And finally, he says, as to the law, I was obedient. I'm blameless. That's not to say he's sinless. The Torah, the law, has means by which to deal with sin, but it is his way of saying my outward conduct is irreproachable. No accusations could be brought against me. And with all these good qualities that he has, four by birth, three by achievement, Paul now says something interesting. He says, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. What Paul does is interesting. He uses an accounting metaphor. He essentially has a chart with credits and debits. And in regard to his pedigree and his achievements, all of those are in the credit column. There's nothing on the debit side. But now in light of Christ, he takes all that's on the credit side, moves it to the debit side, so that only Christ remains in the credit column. And he says in verse 8, more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, 
for whose sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. He moves all his credits to the debit side. He keeps Christ only in the credit side. And he says, I'm willing to lose all these things, his ethnic privilege, his spiritual achievements, so that he stands on Christ alone and trust Christ alone for his salvation. For he understands, as any faithful Jew would, that salvation must come from God alone. And for him, he sees that as coming from God through the work of Jesus Christ. And I love how in verse 8, he speaks of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. In the Greek, he's adding superlative to superlative to express a supreme value. He's essentially saying Christ is not just the best, but he's the bestest. He's not just the bestest, he's the most bestest. Knowing Christ to Paul is his greatest treasure. And for him, knowing Christ isn't simply knowing about Christ. It's not factual information, but it is a living, intimate, personal, experiential relationship of mutual love. And this deep and profound relationship we, he has with Christ is a treasure so great. In comparison, he looks at all of his achievements, all of his privilege, and says they are but rubbish. The Greek word for rubbish is skubalon. It's the word for dung. It has to do with trash or rubbish or excrement, anything that's thrown out in a living situation like Paul would have without plumbing. And he is, by saying everything else is dung, saying, I have no confidence in the flesh. I toss out these privileges. I toss out these achievements with no regrets, because who frets about losing dung? And then he moves on and he says, my righteousness now, my salvation is not by law, but it's through faith. It is through the faithfulness of Christ expressed toward me in his life and death and resurrection. And it is that faithfulness that Paul appropriates by faith. And he leans completely on Christ for his salvation. Now, what's interesting about all that Paul does here is he doesn't toss away junk to gain Christ. He tosses away what's of tremendous value to him. Every once in a while, you'll hear popular testimonies. I've even given testimonies like this, where people talk of how they've left sinful habits or they've left these wrong behaviors for the sake of Christ. And though those testimonies may be sincere, they are not what Paul is doing here. He is not saying, I'm leaving my sins, I'm leaving my bad habits. He's saying, I'm leaving what was of great worth and of great value to me because what I found in Christ is of exceeding value. It surpasses everything that formerly was of worth to me. And then he moves on in the text and he says, I come to know Christ, verse 10, through the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. He's already told us earlier in this letter that we're to share the mindset of Christ, and now he speaks of being conformed to Christ's death, of sharing Christ's sufferings, Christ who suffered temptations and rejection and affliction. And Paul knew all of those because he'd not only lost his privileges and achievements, he'd lost his status, he'd lost relationships, He'd lost safety and security because his ministry met with persecution. Never forget that Paul is writing this from a Roman prison. And then he concludes with saying this, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, some people really have a problem with verse 11. It sounds very conditional. If somehow I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, it doesn't sound confident to us. It doesn't sound hopeful. Why doesn't Paul state that more boldly? And the reason he doesn't is because he is giving a personal testimony. And that requires a certain amount of modesty. 
He's going to make it clear in our reading next week that he knows he hasn't arrived and he's hoping to endure to the end. So his uncertainty here about future resurrection has nothing to do with his belief in resurrection. It has to do with his concern about his own fidelity. Now that's our passage, and what we always do on Wednesday night is we offer three reflections from this passage uh, that we can take into our daily living. And I want to offer the first reflection as this, that Christ is our greatest treasure. Christ is our greatest treasure. It's interesting, Paul speaks in verse 8 of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. For him, that is the most bestest. What do you treasure? What is of surpassing value to you? Is there anything that deserves your lifelong passionate pursuit? Because for Paul, nothing on earth, nothing, even the greatest things, do not compare to knowing Christ. And indeed, that's what salvation is. It is to know the intimate union and deep relationship that God offers us in the person of Christ through the Spirit. Even Jesus speaks like this. John 17, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Every once in a while, I'm convicted of being a pietist, that I'm simply interested in knowing Christ. And my response to that is, I believe that piety matters in the sense that at the end of the day, we should do good works. We need to do works of mercy, works of charity. We need to be the kind of people that are conformed in the likeness of Christ. All that has to do with the life of salvation, but it is all rooted in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ personally. Not by knowing about him, but by having a deep and abiding relationship with him. For those who have tasted of that knowledge, they long for more. Paul here writes 30 years after knowing Christ, and he still longs for a deeper measure of intimacy with Jesus. That indeed is what the church's mission should be about. The church should make much of this greatest treasure, the treasure of knowing Christ, for it is our community's deepest purpose. The church should be known for this. Otherwise, we missed the most bestest thing. And this deep and surpassing value is meant to, over time, completely change our other values, to put other things we value in perspective, because what we value most is knowing Christ Jesus. We are those, as Paul say, says in Verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus, which is a way of saying we glory in Christ Jesus. And so our first reflection is that we are to have as our greatest treasure knowing Christ Jesus. Our second reflection is that we need to be a same things church. Now, what do I mean by being a same things church? And that is this. Paul, at the beginning of this, says, you know, I'm writing the same things to you. You've heard this before, but it is good for you to hear it again. Previously, he taught them the gospel. Now he's still teaching them the gospel because repetition is for our good. We as the church should be people who simply can't get enough of the gospel, which is to say we should be a church that is a same things church. We might change some of our ministry methods, but our message must never change. We must constantly remind one another of the gospel, not only for the good of the unbeliever, but for the building up of the believer. Our lives should be built on this gospel that we have been loved so supremely that Christ has given all that we might know God in Christ Jesus. And we have been accepted purely as a work of grace. We can't get enough of this gospel because it is that gospel that brings us joy, just as it brought joy to Paul. Finally, for our final reflection, salvation for Paul and for the church 
must be the formula Christ plus nothing. Christ is the gospel. Adding anything to it ruins it. When you add to the gospel, you lose the gospel. That's Paul's concern. His concern is that the Judaizers are adding ethnic boundary markers. They're adding works of the law. They're adding things and they're making it so that in some way we save ourselves. And he is concerned that we know that we have been saved completely as an act of grace through the work of Jesus Christ. So that the gospel is not Jesus plus good works or Jesus plus anything. It is Christ and Christ alone. And because it's Christ alone, we can stand safely and securely and confidently before God because of the work that Christ has done on our behalf, which is to say in the end that salvation is a gift. We can't achieve it. We can only receive it. We can't earn it. It is a gift that we are to appropriate. And the reason why Paul sees the need to repeat this again and again is even the most dedicated Christians have a tendency to forget the gospel. We can get caught up in a self-salvation project that leads to pride or leads to despair so that we as believers must do all in our power to resist any gospel of human achievement. Paul says, I have no confidence in the flesh. And of all people, I have the most right to have confidence in the flesh. That's his vote of no confidence to human effort or human achievement. His confidence, his trust is in Christ. So where is your confidence? Is it in your ethnicity? Is it in your achievements? Is it in your zeal or sincerity? Is it in your obedience? Or is your confidence completely in the hands of Christ? Do you trust that Christ will save and save completely? That he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion. For this one is at work within you, both to will and to do of God's good pleasure. You see, the reason Paul is in no way hesitant to repeat the gospel again and again, is that he wants the Philippians to know joy. And joy comes from full and free acceptance by grace through Christ. When that is our confidence, it is impossible for anyone to remove our joy. And that is Paul's passion he wants to know Christ. And my prayer is that that would be true for you and I and for our entire church body. And to that end, I invite you to join with me in this concluding prayer. Gracious God, there is no greater privilege and joy than to gain Christ and to be found in him. May I always remember that there is no lasting value and importance in the things that are so esteemed by the world in comparison with having Jesus as my portion and living for him. Thank you that he died for me, so that by grace through faith in Christ, I am now a child of God and have been given an eternal inheritance in him. Help me to say without hesitation that whatever things there are in my life that I have gained, I counted them all as loss for the sake of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Well, that's our reflection for this week. We'll continue in verse 12 next week, and we'll see that Paul, as he appropriates this grace, is completely active within that grace. And so we'll see kind of the flip side as Paul uh, makes every effort to run the race, to gain the prize. And so we'll look at that deeply next week, Lord willing. Until then, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.